call this meeting of the Duncanville Independent School District to order. Let the record show that a quorum of board members is present, that the meeting has been duly called, and that notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. We will now move to opening ceremonies, and I ask Joe Bear Cruz to lead us in the invocation. Heavenly Father, even though we're separated from our students, we still treasure them, Lord, and their families. We ask for a hedge protector upon them and everything they do this summer, Lord. Let them go and get their spirit, their faith, and just have the motivation to come back to the new school year, Lord. Pray for our senior leadership team and everyone involved in the process of, of starting a new. Lord, help us synergize our efforts. We thank you for our superintendent, our school board, our senior leadership team, and everyone that has anything to do with the success that we plan for this next year. Heavenly Father, I pray all this in your name. Amen. now move to recognitions, commendations, and we welcome Tiara Richards. Um, we have nothing for the group this morning or afternoon. Sorry, it's been a long day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we now move to the superintendent's reports, and I turn it over to Dr. Smith. Well, thank you, Madam President. I uh, have just a few short items that I'd like to report on uh, this evening. Uh, the first is to provide the board with an update on summer school. You may remember we have uh, made some adjustments and changes to our summer school program. Uh, we've definitely placed an emphasis on um, enrichment versus just uh, a credit recovery program. So I wanted to give you an update on some of the good things that are happening there. Um, we've been in school a couple of weeks now. We've had a GT camp. Uh, that uh, was a camp that was focused on students in grades one through six. A lot of outdoor activities, a lot of STEM activities associated with that. We also have had a creativity camp, also uh, focused with our GT students. Uh, this camp was held at the high school. These students explored STEAM opportunities, everything from yoga to mad science. Uh, we've had a camp uh, three, which is uh, for 37 students. Uh, we had 37 students actually in attendance today. Uh, students took classes on audiovisual production, commercial photography, graphic design, collision repair, just a number of different courses throughout uh, the course of the camp that our students are being exposed to. Uh, and then at the Collegiate Academy, they're hosting a, a one-week summer bridge program. Uh, the program is designed to provide students with support and get them ready for the rigorous programming that they're going to be experiencing through the Collegian Academy uh, campus. And so we had 85 students from the new cohort attend. And then we ended up with a, a bilingual summer school uh, update where we had 107 pre-K kindergarten students that were in attendance. And they are immersed uh, in an environment with an emphasis on reading, writing, and math content. Uh, in sp word walls in Spanish and English, uh, and also the Gomez and Gomez model, which continues to be a very successful implementation in our district. So uh, really excited about the additional learning time that our students are being engaged in learning activities through the course of the summer and what it's going to do for them and, and their ongoing development uh, as we get prepared to start the school year next year. Uh, the second item that I wanted to update the board on is, um, you may recall, we are promoting a healthy summer program uh, for our students. We're calling it a, a healthy summer meal for kids. And so we serve breakfast uh, and lunch free uh, for all students that are uh, 18 years or below. 
uh, in our school districts. And so I pulled some data uh, from uh, the first uh, couple of weeks of the program. And so we had a combined 1,642 students receive breakfast and we had 4,432 students receive lunch. So think about this, this is not just students that are in summer school during the day. These are students that have an opportunity to get a free meal, breakfast, lunch, uh, that just if you live in Duncanville, you just show up and you're able to get, uh, get a meal. And so uh, you know, I've been very interested into how this program would work. I think it's off to a great start and really uh, serving our students and families uh, well. So I wanted to update you uh, on that. And then the final update that I have for you this evening, we have been in the planning stages of developing our own police department. One of the major hurdles that you have to clear is uh, an application process. It's called the TCOL, and that's for Texas Commission on Law Enforcement. And so uh, you have to complete this application. It has to be approved uh, in order for you to start your own police department. And so uh, part of that application pro pro process requires a site visit. Uh, and actually, they don't give you a heads up. They just kind of show up. And you have to be prepared. You have to be ready. Uh, and so uh, our TCO uh, performed their site visit today. And we were informed that Duncanville ISD has met all the requirements to begin a police department. Uh, we should receive our law enforcement agency number and our FBI number within 30 days. And so it's perfect timing for us. Uh, of course, a lot of effort went into that with our staff, uh, Melissa Cates and Sam Nix and our security staff all really played a role in uh, getting us to this point. So we want to thank them for their efforts. Also perfect timing with the police chief. We are really um, uh, making great progress with the interview process there. Uh, and I anticipate having a chief in place as early as uh, bringing a name to you in August. So uh, uh, everything is uh, pretty much coming together as we wanted it to with regard to our police uh, the agency. So uh, those are the three items that I wanted to report uh, this evening. I'll turn it back over to Madam President. Chair Gould will now have the report from the Education Foundation and I call Miss Debbie Lively. Good evening, everybody. Um, I've got some good news to report. It's been a while since uh, we've uh, reported to uh, the board, and I'd like to go in chronological order. First, we had our gala at the end of April, and we were able to net uh, over $23,000 uh, from this event. So it was uh, very successful, um, and we're very grateful to all of the uh, uh, dinner committee uh, and the volunteers who helped set up and clean up and also to our sponsors and those who uh, provided auction items and also gave uh, extra donations. So we're really thrilled about that. Um, late in May and early in June, we uh, distributed our uh, education grants, which is really the, the fundamental reason we're uh, uh, an organization, and we're, we're pleased to give out over $39,000 in grants, um, and I'll just identify the schools uh, quickly and the teachers who received these grants. Uh, DHS had two grants um, awarded, and one grant went to six teachers. They combined efforts, and it can be used by all of those teachers. Uh, Karen McQuaid, Erskine Hawkins, Christina Falcon, Shauna Kyle, Lenitra James, and Yvette Green uh, were awarded a grant of eighty-five fifty. Um, uh, also at DHS, Justin Edwards was awarded a grant for eleven thousand eight hundred and forty-six dollars. Uh, Maryfield Elementary, uh, Nicole Nicole Williams was awarded. Uh, $1,740. Central Elementary, uh, Evan Ingwall uh, was awarded $6,124. Uh, 
Fair Meadows Elementary, Rebecca Moore was awarded $10,375. In Hyman Elementary, Debbie Thibodeau was awarded $500. And um, these amounts were specific to the grant request. So we did not arbitrarily give out 500 to one school and 11,000 to another. So it, it met the specific grant, um, grant application um, budget. Um, I think more importantly than the $39,000, um, I'd like to uh, inform the board, uh, the Board of Trustees, that we have now, since the inception of the uh, foundation, we have distributed over $1 million. In fact, I believe, if my numbers are accurate, it'd be $1,003,178. So we're very pleased uh, to have done that. I want to thank um, all the members of the grant committee who helped uh, review the grants and the board members who were able to visit the schools uh, with the help of Janelle Fahey and Jody setting up with the schools. We were able to visit and surprise each teacher. Uh, for DHS and for Maryfield, uh, we were able to go actually to the teachers um, well, and to uh, Hyman, we were actually able to go and surprise the teachers. And at DHS and Maryfield, we actually took the uh, band drumline. And thanks uh, to Dr. Smith, who helped us get the bus uh, to take the, the drumline to Maryfield. I think that teacher was the most excited, and she used her prior uh, DHS band experience and marched down the hall <laughs> with her big check, um, as did the principal with her cowbell behind her. Uh, but it was really inspiring, and the little kids were all lined up in the halls and uh, were really thrilled, um, and uh, the custodians and other teachers were telling the little ones that they can't get the, their phone. So it was really fun. DHS, a little bit bigger, spread out, but people wondered what's this noise, this racket uh, in the hallways, and uh, it was a good racket, uh, but uh, it was really thrilling, um, and it really, really hits home why we do this, and uh, it was inspiring. Uh, we and the teachers had tears in, in our eyes. Uh, at uh, Central and Fair Meadows, the principal prefer, principals preferred that we actually attend the award ceremony. And so uh, we had two sets uh, of folks uh, because the timing was a little uh, difficult. And we ended up being able to do both but at the same time. Um, but we actually went up on stage and surprised the teachers. So that was fun. That occurred in uh, June. So anyway, we are uh, extremely thrilled that we were able to, to give out this money. And we're in even more proud to have given over a million dollars to the district in one year. We have some upcoming important dates. Um, starting a week from today, we have a new executive director who will be full-time, and we're thrilled to have her. Her name is Rosalind Fallhaber. She um, is most recently from the Castleberry Independent School District. She's been a teacher and counselor there, most recently a counselor. And she also started their foundation and uh, did that while she was a full-time employee of the district as a counselor. Um, she's, I think, ready to move on to the fundraising and uh, so she uh, resigned her position as a counselor at the end of the year, but she will be starting um, on uh, Monday. And she is extremely passionate about education. Uh, she understands it. She understands the teacher. She understands where the parents are coming from and the kids. So I think that insight will be invaluable. Um, she also is extraordinarily energetic. And as I heard um, uh, from some of the uh, search committee members, uh, one of them, this person did not tell me this directly, but I believe he was ready to hire her, you know, the day she interviewed, but we had a few more folks to interview, but she was that impressive. Uh, so we look forward to having her um, uh, at the next.
Christ update and look forward to having you meet her. Um, I also want to uh, publicly thank Mighty Vale Sykes for stepping in as our interim. She was part-time, but she did that while working as a, uh, at a full-time job. And um, she was really, really great. And I talked to her probably three to five times a week. Um, and, um, you know, she's passionate about the district as well. She has three kids in the district. And um, um, she was extraordinarily helpful. So we, were, we are very appreciative to her work. Um, we have two uh, more events this year. It's a little while away, but it will be here before you know it, both of them. The first one is the Heart of Duncanville 5K, which will be October 13th at 8.30 in the morning. And Casey has already started this, and we have our first meeting, I think, Tuesday of the month. Yeah. Um, and next is the Champions for Children Golf Tournament, which is going to be um, on Monday, November 5th. This year it will be at Thorn Tree Country Club. And I believe it's going to be starting uh, around <coughs> noon. And then I guess there will be a lunch, and then it will go in the afternoon. Greg Zilka and John Casey are chairing that. So they're excited about it. They've already got um, sponsors lined up. But you will be hearing more about that, I'm sure. And, of course, from Casey, he's the master salesman. Um, he will be promoting that. Um, but anyway, that's uh, the update. Do you guys have any questions? I'm glad to answer them. And just one comment from me. I had an opportunity to have lunch uh, last week with um, the group uh, at the foundation and uh, had the option on the option rather with uh, Bob yes Bob Bob yes Bob. so it, it was we had a good time oh good good yeah. thank you glad glad that you do that and thank you for taking the time to do that thank you miss right. Hadley we thank appreciate you. your report thank you we will now have the bond update from miss fields Good evening, Madam President, to board members and Dr. Smith. It's again my pleasure uh, to present to you the update on the really final phases of the 2014 bond program. It's been a uh, few meetings since I've been before you, and so just kind of want to reflect again and uh, review our projects. Of course, you see there um, the Acton replacement, Hastings, Hyman, and Kittimer, and that work, of course, is 100% percent complete. And our district-wide upgrades, our safety and security packages, of course, all of those complete along with uh, technology. And I will pause right there to say that uh, as we move into the renovation work at Brandenburg, we will be completing that technology piece and package of, with the safety security part. Uh, aging facilities, the Daniel Intermediate, of course, was completed on last school year. Under aging facilities, uh, you see those uh, packages there, and I do want to kind of give you a more status update on those. Um, package one, we are at 90% complete. There are just still some punch list things there, and those, all those campuses listed, Alexander, Central, Fair Meadows, et cetera, Panther Stadium, at 90% completion. Maryfield, of course, was the last campus, uh, and so we're f finishing up work there. Uh, Panther Stadium was already turned back to, over to the athletic department, and uh, I'm very pleased. I know one of the things that was a part of that is the changing stations, and all those restrooms received those as uh, was designed. So when the season again starts in the fall, uh, the families will have access to changing stations and all those renovated restrooms at Panther Stadium. Package 2 uh, is right now at 25%. Uh, and um, Brandenburg, the work began uh, there uh, on June the 6th. And I want to say thank you to uh, Mr. Joe Paterka, the maintenance team, along with uh, Ms. Cowan and her technology team, along with the warehouse team, and then finally Ms. Tamara Thompson at Brandenburg because they had to move 
every teacher out of every space there at the campus. Now they've been pa pra uh, packing and preparing and et cetera, but you can imagine to move the entire campus in one day. So thank you to all the teamwork, made it work. Ms. Thompson had her staff ready. And so in the heat, our fellows and uh, ladies as well, um, moved on June the 6th, and that work is well underway. As a matter of fact, today I was updated that 16 of the classrooms that they touched, and you're going to see a little bit about the scope here in a minute, uh, are ready to have the things move back. So the work is rapidly uh, going forward. They're working on the weekends, et cetera. Bird Middle School, the work will uh, begin uh, shortly, and then Reed Middle School, the work has already begun there. Uh, package 3. Our fire alarm and PA system, uh, we're at 50 to 60 percent, and of course, all those sites you see there, uh, the work has begun, particularly the rough end work, the work that they have to do behind the walls and in the ceilings, they've begun the majority of that. And we're at 50 to 60 percent. We're going to move now to the uh, North Star report, and again, um, we have a representative from Huckabee uh, here with us. Ms. Whitfield Horn is here this evening if we have any questions, but want to update you on this. Of course, you see there at Maryfields, I said they're basically done, the restrooms, nice, shiny, clean, the fixtures, partitions, the punch work. Uh, again, that's the 10% the of the things that we'll have to do to fix anything that's not to our standard. At Brandenburg, they did start the restrooms uh, right before school started, I guess about four weeks before school started. And so that, those pictures that you see here, was prob they were probably taken uh, uh, right at the end of May. So a lot of work has gone forward since that time. And then at Brandenburg, you see, of course, another group of restrooms there and final punch list. Under aging uh, facilities, um, Looking ahead, of course, um, outside with the access uh, accessibility study, Mirrorfield and Harden, there's some minor exterior civil work that has to be done with the handicap accessible ramp. This summer, of course, we've talked about Brandenburg, Reed, the cafeteria and the clinic restrooms, and then Bird, of course, the work beginning in their locker rooms and their staff restrooms. Under package three, the fire alarm and intercom upgrades, the majority of the campuses have had. Uh, sites, a lot of the rough end work um, and the city of Dallas sites are in plan review. Of course, we have uh, the, those locations that are, are in the city of Dallas, and so we're working with them, uh, looking at those plans. You see the information about tapping of speakers and retesting of the system. Of course, they did uh, an assessment prior to the work and now doing the retest to make sure that the systems are working, and we are finding some things we're going to have to fine tune but we think we're going to be able to do that without any additional cost. And the rough end, of course, as I've shared at all the sites, the fire alarm cutover, uh, making sure that the, the fire alarms work actually along with the system that will alert the fire department, that work will take place this summer. And on a final note, um, I want to show the, the legend there. Uh, you see the work at, this is at Brandenburg. And so you see the major scope of work in blue. And then you, um, if you orientate yourself to the campus, of course, you see the vestibule there in green and the, uh, the uh, secure entry data. They're going to have a lot of work there. Um, the, the floor base and the base in the yellow is new flooring. And you can see basically it covers the entire campus with the exception of the gym and, and uh, but the cafeteria, the flooring, and then of course uh, in the library, um, they're going to have major scope of work. They're getting a new circulation desk and refresh there in their library flooring, and then um, additionally uh, the restrooms where you'll see the blue uh, larger spaces. Those are refresh of, of restrooms. So uh, any questions about? Uh, about Brandenburg, that's that's quite a bit. We have a compressed summer to get it all done before before school starts. And as I take my seat, I do want to add a bit of good news uh, that's really kind of related to um, 
the aging facilities, but on last week, 50% of the furniture for STEAM Academy at Kenmer was delivered and installed, and tomorrow, the other half will be here, so our staff will be on site making sure that all works, so we're very excited about that. I know the folks that are going to be at Kenmer and the STEAM Academy are looking forward to sitting in all that pretty new uh, ultra-modern furniture. Are there any questions for me? Thank, Thank you, Ms. Bill. Thank we you. appreciate your information. We will now move to the consent agenda. Do I have a motion? Uh, Madam President, I move we uh, approve the uh, consent agenda as additional item to the Joint Chiefs Staff Report. Second. Thank you. Is there a second? The motion was made by Tom Kennedy to uh, approve, no, to move the item 6D to the consent agenda and board member Joe Veracruz seconded. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. All opposed, motion passed 7 0. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as amended? Board member Tom Kennedy moved and Renee McNeely seconded the motion to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Thank you. No opposed. Motion carries 7 0. Now move to the action agenda item, item 6A, submitting a nominee for the Region 10 Position A seat on the TASB Board of Directors. This will be presented by Dr. Smith. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, yield to the board to uh, see if they want to make a recommendation for uh, a board member to serve in this capacity. Is there a second? Okay, there was a motion by Carla Fahey to uh, recommend Tom Kennedy to the uh, TASB board uh, to a position A in a seat on the TASB board and it was seconded by Cassandra. Are there any questions, comments, or discussion? All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Thank you. Motion carries 7 0. We'll now move to action item B Enterprise Technologies and Proactive Maintenance Using Systems, ETA PMUS, Contract for Network Engineering Consulting Services, presented by Andrea Fields. Tonight we are um, asking the board's approval of the continued services uh, through uh, enterprise technology and proactive maintenance using systems, the ETAPMUS, to uh, maintain and sustain our, our district's technology infrastructure. Uh, as you have in your handout and your packet, uh, we have been using the consulting services of this group uh, to provide us with uh, someone as a network engineer. And over the course of the year, I think initially this was uh, signed in November, we have used the services and have an individual who is within the district to provide those services. Based on the policy that you have, CH Local, uh, anytime the district uh, has over $50,000 worth of goods or services, we have to ask your approval. And so we know by the end of this fiscal year, we will reach the $50,000 threshold. So we're asking for your approval. Uh, the technology questions, I'm going to defer to Ms. Cowan. Uh, she can explain 
and detailed what this individual has done for us and continues to serve us in a, a, a wonderful way. So are there any questions? have a motion to consider approval of enterprise technologies and proactive maintenance using systems contracts for network engineering consulting services. So moved. Second. Board member Tom Kennedy moved and board member Cassandra Phillips uh, seconded. Our Pardon me. Sorry. My ears didn't work. Than I didn't need them. Are there any questions, comments, or discussion? All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Any opposed? Motion passes 7 0. We'll now move to action agenda item C resolution for sale of former Toyota dealership presented by Melissa Cates. Good evening, Madam President. Board of Trustees, Dr. Smith. Tonight we have before you a resolution to sell the property formerly known as the Toyota dealership. The city of Duncanville recently complete, completed a comprehensive plan and they created the Tax Increment Financing District Reinvestment Zone Number 1, which is also known as a TIF. The district owns property that is located inside the TIF territory. <laughs> That's a mouthful. And the city has come to the board to purchase this property. On April 16th, 2018, the board moved to have the superintendent move forward with negotiations to sell this property to the city. And the uh, deal has been done and we've reached a, a contract on that property. So what this resolution does is it approves the sale to the city and it also allows the board president to finalize the closing documents on behalf of the district. So I'm happy to answer any questions you may have about this resolution or the sale of the Toyota property. Are there any questions? I'd like to read the resolution. Okay. Whereas the board of trustees, the board of the Duncanville Independent School District, the district is authorized by the Texas Education Code 11.51 to govern and oversee the management of the public schools in the district and whereas under Texas Education Code 11.151C, all rights and titles to the real property of the district are vested in the board and their successors in office and whereas pursuant to Texas Education Code 11.151C and 11.154A, the board may dispose of property that is no longer necessary for the operation of the district and may, by resolution, authorize the sale of such property. And whereas, pursuant to Texas Education Code 11.154B, such sale of the property is to be by deed signed and executed by the president of the board to the purchaser of the property reciting the resolution of the board of trustees authorizing the sale. And whereas on April 16, 2018, this board authorized the superintendent to initiate the sale of the former Toyota dealership here on college property, whereas the property is legally described as approximately 4.69 acres <coughs> situated in the Robert F. Merrill Survey, Track 3.1, Abstract Number 883, Page 375 in the city of Duncanville, Dallas County, Texas, and is identified by the Dallas Central Appraisal District as account number, I won't read that, and whereas <laughs> <laughs> the property contains improvements including an automotive display building totaling approximately 23,940 square feet, an automotive service building totaling approximately 8,640 square feet, in an office building totaling approximately 2,650 square feet, all of which were constructed in or around 1981. And whereas officials of the district pursuant to board directive and the notice and bid provisions of local government code 272.001 offer the property for sale, and whereas the district received an acceptable order for, order, sorry, offer for the price 
sale and purchase of the property from the city of Duncanville in the amount of 900,000 plus offer good and valuables consideration. Now therefore be it resolved by the Board of Trustees of the Duncanville Independent School District that resolved the board fully authorizes the sale of the property to the city of Duncanville for the amount of 900,000 plus other good and valuable consideration by execution, execution of a deed and contract of sale with terms agreed agreeable to the district. Such deed and contract to be executed by the president of this board of trustees as the property is no longer needed for the educational purposes in operation of the district and the maintenance of said property is consuming resources in excess of its contribution to the furtherance of the education purpose of the district and resolve the deed shall recite the approval of this resolution by the board. Do I have a motion to consider approval of the resolution for sale of the former Toyota dealership? Board Member Phil McNeely moved and Board Member Tom Kennedy seconded. Are there any questions, comments, or discussion? I have a question. Okay. Several times in here we mentioned the Murphy Park case. It's the, the analogy of the contract for $900,000 plus other goods and valuable consideration. What plus other goods and valuable consideration? Mm -hmm. That just means the title and the deed and all of the rights to the property. So we're not getting real, real specific. Unfortunately, no. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Okay, all in favor, pass the 7 0. We next go to information discussion agenda item. First reading of the board operating procedures for the 2018 19 school year. Presenters, Dr. Mark Smith. Thank you, Madam President. Each year uh, we bring the uh, board operating procedures uh, before the board uh, to formally take a look at them, see if there's uh, anything that we need to update or edit, or if there's any feedback uh, that the board would like to give to me uh, regarding the board operating procedures. Uh, if there are, then of course we'll note those and then we'll make the changes accordingly. Our typical practice is we take a first look at them, give the board time to discuss um, and uh, review the information, and then we'll come back and approve it at uh, the subsequent board meeting. So today is the opportunity for the board if there are any uh, comments or feedback or edits that you would like, or just any uh, comments associated with the board uh, operating procedures, uh, we'll take note of those. operating procedures. If there are none, then we will continue our practice and uh, we'll move forward. Thank you. Next item is D, the first reading of student handbook for 2018-2019, presented by Mr. Kreitzberg. Good evening, Madam President, members of the board and Dr. Smith. Um, come to you with a First reading of the student code, I believe is it the handbook? Handbook is first. Um, this is uh, somewhat of a formality. There are minor changes as this was not a legislative year, so we're not impacted by new ordinances or laws. Uh, most of it is just fine tuning and definition. Uh, the areas uh, that were impacted minimally are listed in the uh, the document give providing the background information. Uh, so it was more so about uh, refining terms and definitions for clarity, but no substantial changes in the student handbook this year. So that's first reading. Any other questions? Yes, Tom. I have a question, uh, comment I have uh, on the hazing at page 59, which gives some examples of stuff. My question more is, are we going to have anything to educate students to help them understand what hazing is, so that they can understand where those things, because that's just 
explain that to your parents or something like that. And they, they didn't explain it that way. They just assumed that it was the guy that was there. So I was pretty pissed. So the parents were instantly amazed that it was our actual high school employee. So they came to see us right away. They explained to the kids that it was the guy. Them understanding what age we were was pretty important. So when I was in the theater every time, I was working with the theater a lot, to help the kids to know what age they were when they were doing their projects and stuff like that. So I don't know. I just feel like it was wrong. Most hazing incidents typically are associated with a student organization many times. And I know that uh, sponsors, directors, and coaches are uh, very are attuned to what's going on with their students. Um, and in turn, also our counseling staff on our campuses. Uh, teachers are, we do review with bullying as well. At the beginning of the year, all employees go through uh, training as far as recognition of uh, initial signs of hazing or bullying and, and that it is a uh, zero tolerance, so to speak, as far as our approach as adults and, and interacting with students whenever we may feel that that type of behavior is occurring or has the potential to occur. I, I, I'm not familiar with a formal program uh, specifically for hazing. Can do that. Just to see if it works in the classroom. Because they seem to have some kind of results to it. I know we have few reported incidents of hazing, more so bullying, so to speak. Most but both bullying. being somewhat it's mutual. Like True. Like hazing in school and then they come out and they yes. say, Thank you, uh, Mr. Crutchford. The next item is the first reading of the Student Code of Conduct for 2018-2019. And with, with it not being a legislative year, there were, there were no changes other than uh, a couple of definitions uh, that were noted um, in the document that was provided to you. So um, these were more so about uh, fighting, severe fighting, severe fights, those types of things, giving more clarity to what would constitute um, a behavior being classified as one of those. But just a couple of uh, glossary terms, uh, retaliation along with persistent misbehavior, better clarity as to um, what those mean, uh, giving some guidance to campus administration and teachers and defining those, same for self-defense and then also um, serious misbehavior at, at the alternative school, and then sexual harassment, as far as more clarity to those definitions in the glossary. But within the code of conduct itself, there were no changes. Are there any questions? Yeah, uh, if I had a question, my comment would be, if I, I get a lot of feedback from people about dress code and how it's not followed, what can you do to make it be followed? Because I, I tell people complain to me is you would enforce it. You would enforce those kids or would you be a long way toward enforcing it whenever it works? But there's so many things that go on that the kids just, once they know they can get away with it, they just continue to do it. I think the teachers and administrators turn a blind eye to it and say, oh, well, they're, they're gonna do it anyway. But you know, we need to do something different and better. Uh, and again, most of the comments I get are from high school teachers very few from that experience that I've had some time with those students. Let's make sure that those things get moved up and, and the kids understand that, that we as a school district, you know, we have these rules and we want those rules enforced and we're not going to tolerate the kids not complying with those rules. Now, I don't mean to have okay if kids go home or not in class and all that kind of stuff, but there's just got to be some way that we as a, a administrative staff and 
behavior can make these kids understand that, you know, rules are just what they are, and you have to follow them. One of the big things that I get feedback on is the type of pants that girls wear. They don't comply with dress codes. The type of shoes that girls wear, and I'm not picking on girls, but that's, that's what people complain to me about. And I had standards. They're not allowed. I was at the high school one day doing something, not intentionally, but so everybody was feeling bad. <laughs> but, and it's true, there are a lot of kids that wear standards, girls that wear standards at school. And I asked the teacher, I said, well, what, you had on standards, so I said, well, what's the difference in you having on standards and the kids? Well, she told me what the difference was, so we're going to deal with that. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, just, I don't know. I get frustrated because we sit up here and we make rules, and then we see rules not being followed. And I know a lot of it is the teachers get tired of it, and I appreciate that and understand that. But I, I don't know. I just think that's going to be something that working with the teachers to make them understand what their job is and what we expect of them. And then we don't necessarily tear down the kids because of what we expect from you. And that brings us to the next one. You're not doing it, so you don't need to do it. So to take those comments um, to heart, um, one of the things that our teachers and our administrators, I think they have to balance every day is you know, how to make sure that we are maximizing the instructional time for students. And so uh, there is a fine line that our campus staff uh, walk between having a standard that is acceptable for their school to dress, but also not removing the students from the learning environment for uh, relatively what is a very minor infraction. And so they are, you know, th they're all held accountable for uh, results and we know that only way that you can have a positive impact instruction on a student and for that student to be in that classroom receiving uh, instruction. Uh, and so, uh, you know, sometimes there was their, their judgment. Is it better for this student to be in my class receiving instruction, getting prepared for uh, you know, the expectations or because they have them on sandals, do I need to put them out of the class? And so I'm not making light of the rule. I'm just uh, wanting to uh, help expand the understanding from a teacher side. It may not always be it's a negligence on the teacher's part to not want to uh, hold a kid accountable. Uh, some of that may be the spirit of trying to make sure they're there serving the kid and giving that him or her the best opportunity to remain in the classroom and receive instruction. So we'll continue to work to figure out where that line is so, so that we can create a win-win and have a policy that we uh, will uh, work with our administrative team to uh, enforce while at the same time trying to make sure that we're able to keep our students in the classroom where they can receive instruction. So we'll, 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 we'll work together to make that happen. Yeah, that's why I say what I said. I'm not advocating for that to happen. them to understand that there are rules and the rules have to need to be followed and how we enforce that has a lot to do with how the kids receive the answers to the questions. So, I, it's, it's always been an issue. It's always been a battle. It's just something that continues to bother me uh, to see them let kids get away with things more so than they have to have to get away with it. But uh, like I said, we do it as administrators and that's the type of thing I see. So, people that complain to me about the use of teachers, they usually complain to me about the use of professors. So <laughs> that's how I see it. So like I said, they want to make sure the kids are there when they're there. So that's what we're trying to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion from the board? J just a comment. Uh, another word that does go in enforcement is incentive. And that's, that's hard in large schools is that if it starts at day one or the first three, um, most of our kiddos that come through our system, uh, they get it. It's sometimes the, the, the new kid out of the pool who never gets it. <laughs> but, but it must be some sort of incentive. Okay, thank you, Mr. Crockford. The next item is the 2018-2019 budget update presented by Dr. Ed, Ed Beebe.
Good evening. I've heard it said that confession is good for the soul, so I need to do a little soul cleansing. Uh, the budget book that we gave you last Monday, there's a couple of errors on page three. The totals stay the same. There's nothing different as far as the totals. A couple of the functions are, are different. I've got a corrected page for that that we can give you tonight. We can take your book up and, and fix that page. But uh, I was looking to do that today. And, of course, you always proofread everything, and you never miss anything until you've printed it. And are you, you going to take our books up, or is that correct? Can or I can just leave them? No, if you we'll like just uh, we'll just we'll just uh, we have the extra page, so we'll just attach it, and make it easy okay. for you. We'll just give you each one of your pages. But it, but if you don't want to give up your book tonight, I'll give you that page, and then we can put it in. This book or this Friday. page? The, this book. The, 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 the bound page. one. Okay. This bound. It's page three of that. Once again, the totals for the revenue and expenditure are all the same. There's just a couple of the functions that are different, and you need you need to know exactly the way the budget's been put together. And speaking of that, we'll highlight a few things that uh, we talked about last week. Uh, once again, we use 9.5% value growth to uh, determine the budget and an ADA of 11,919. Uh, general revenue and expenses were up $1.2 million, or just a little over 1%. Uh, both the other funds were pretty close to the same, uh, no major changes in those. Uh, the state share of our funding went from 58% to 54%, and the local share picked up that other 4% 4, 4 from uh, 40 to 44. Uh, payroll or the 6,100 accounts take up 86.5% of the budget. Uh, instruction and student services were a little over 77% of the budget, and general administration was 4.8%. We added staff to Collegiate and STEAM Academy, and we're going to add a chief of police that's that's in the budget. Uh, if you remember, I told you what was in it and what wasn't. It doesn't contain any spending from fund balance. It's it, They're all balanced. Uh, there are no salary increases. There's no change in the health insurance contribution. Um, and uh, we didn't fund but a few of the requests that came through the SLT budget process. And finally, we... We discussed the bleak future that uh, our financial advisor uh, talked to you about and, and Dr. Smith and I have been talking to you about as far as if something doesn't happen in Austin, uh, it'll, it'll, it's the fate of all districts. It's certainly not just Duncanville. But that's pretty well what we talked about. I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you might have come up with since then or uh, want to talk about or anything you want to make sure we cover uh, Friday before you adopt the budget while you kind of process and get prepared to ask any questions if you have I just want to um, make a couple of comments as it relates to the budget um, of course our plan is to uh, bring the budget before you for uh, to adopt uh, on this Friday and so I am in the final stages uh, although we're not giving raises this year we certainly want to make sure that we take care of our staff. And so I'm in the final phases of uh, putting our, our criteria in place uh, that will allow us to accomplish a couple of things. One, uh, provide all of our full-time employees in Duncanville ISD with a one-time payment of $1,000 that I'm looking to uh, be able to uh, give to employees at the beginning of the year. Uh, and so by beginning of the year, September, October is uh, working towards September, so we'll that's part of kind of what I'll be doing over the next couple of days, just making sure everything lines up so that we can actually make that payment in September. I'll have it finalized for you by the 22nd. I don't know for sure, but, but that's what I'm wanting to do. And then also matching the insurance increase. Insurance increased by $16 this year, and so we're going to match that. So all of our full-time employees uh, with the budget that we'll be bringing to you on Friday uh, it will include a one-time payment of $1,000, uh, and we'll be matching uh, the uh, $16 increase in insurance from QR uh, to us. The other thing I wanted to uh, do also uh, along those lines is just kind of recap uh, our compensation plan. 
because there is uh, not a raise this year, uh, our compensation plan remains the same. And so each year you adopt the budget and the compensation plan. And so I wanted Ms. Brown to come and just uh, give, uh, she gave the presentation to you last week. So unless you have any questions, we didn't want to give the full presentation to you. But uh, you have the information, just wanted to highlight a few points and then uh, address any questions that you all have regarding our compensation plan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, Madam President and Board of Trustees, Dr. Smith. Um, just a few highlights from the presentation that was presented earlier, um, and this is in reference to our teacher compensation plan. Um, and if the presentation is ready, we can um, show a couple of things on those slides. Um, first, I'd talk to you about the group that we are um, compared to as far as our compensation. It's a different presentation. It's the compensation update. So just a moment. So the comparison group that we are compared to, there are 1,031 public school districts in the state of Texas, um, and this study only compares us to a small portion of those districts. Um, and the, the way that those districts, again, are selected are that they are, um, they mirror us as far as the student and population, not the number of students enrolled in the, those districts, but the population, and they're also um, in our group based on their proximity, how close they are to our district. So a lot of times we share staff, we share substitutes um, with these uh, districts. Um, we talked about um, our teacher salary market comparison. Um, we talked about the study that we do and the update annually with TASB HR services. And when looking at our teacher um, salary market comparison group, there were three lines, and I believe you probably you have a copy of that presentation. Um, the green line shows our actual teacher salaries, and so although when you look on our website and you see our hiring schedule um, for our teachers, we are not on a step schedule. We're on a hiring schedule, and so what you see online reflects what you will be hired in with that particular number of years of experience coming in. However, our actual um, teacher salaries are above market um, across the board. Um, and of course, as the years progress here in Duncanville, you see us become more competitive after the 10-year mark. Um, so uh, for example, um, some information that was shared was where we compare to other market, other districts within our comparison group when we get to 20 and 25 and 30 years. The chart last week did not go as far as 30 years, but I wanted to be able to provide that information to you um, due to one of, of one of the questions that we had. So at 20 years, um, our actual salaries in our district are around $59,900. Um, at 25 years, we are around $62,000 average. And for teachers with 30 plus years, we're averaging about 66,000. So by looking at our website, you can't see that information, but when you're looking at our actual teacher salaries in district, it becomes very clear that we are competitive with employees who choose to stay here and serve in Duncanville ISD. Um, the last piece of information that I'll share with you was um, in reference to the number of years of experience that our teachers currently have in the district. We have a fairly new staff. Um, our teachers are averaging 9.4 years total experience. The state average is 11 years. So I also wanted to remind you of that. When you look at our uh, median, median salary overall, um, that is reflective of the, the newer staff that we have here in Duncanville ISD. Um, we would not be proposing to make any changes to our teacher hiring schedule or our compensation schedule for the upcoming school year. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next item in the up is the update on PACE's academic schedule presented by Sam Nix and Tijuana Hudson. Good evening, Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Smith. It is my pleasure to share with you this evening um, just a few ideas that we are considering for Pace High School. We feel that this is an optimum time uh, to look at, to review, to revisit, uh, to reflect on. Are we truly offering our students the best opportunity to be successful at Pace? And so to present this information to you, just looking at some of the things that we're thinking through, that we're reflecting on, is the new principal at PACE, Ms. Uh, Hudson, and she's going to provide uh, detailed information just on what we're thinking about, what we're looking at, what some of the possibilities are, and some of the benefits for our students at PACE. Ms. Hudson. Good evening. 
Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Smith, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Um, I, since the last school board meeting, I've had the opportunity to look at some campus data and also sit down and meet one-on-one -on -one with every teacher at PACE just to listen to what their concerns are for their students and to hear the heart for the kids that they serve at that school. Um, and I'm proud to be the leader of a school with dedicated teachers who are willing to go above and beyond to make sure that their students are successful. Um, but in looking at that data, I ran across some eye-opening information that I wanted to share with you um, and give you the reason behind me looking at restructuring the school day at PACE. Um, first of all, the information that I found out was during the 2017-2018 school year, the average attendance rate at PACE hovered right around 77%, which is well below that 90% that we look for in the state. Um, and I've looked at the mission of Pace High School and really reflected on that mission. And uh, two things that stuck out to me were that we want to make sure that we are meeting the individual instructional needs of the students that we serve in that school, but also provide a flexible learning environment for those students. And so there are many, many reasons that we may have this 77% attendance rate. Um, some of our students are parents. Um, some of them have employment responsibilities because they are the breadwinner for their household. Um, we have some students that have medical issues that have had them to come to PACE, but we also have a group of students who are just simply not motivated, and so attendance is an issue on that campus. And so the plan for restructuring the school day is, uh, there's three goals that I want to accomplish. Number one, meeting those uh, concerns that the teachers have shared with me, um, improving the attendance rate at PACE, um, also staying true to the mission by providing that flexible learning environment and meeting the kids' educational needs. And then lastly, making sure that we are graduating students in a timely manner. Um, and so two options I have pr to present to you this evening. Um, the first one is the concept of a night school. What I'd like to do is open up the building two nights a week so that students have the opportunity to come in, those students who don't have computers at home and can't continue to work through their, their coursework at home, they've got an opportunity to come and have some additional seat time with an instructor, get the tutoring that they need so that they can progress through their program and get done with these credits in as quick a manner as possible. Um, but also for those students who are at Duncanville High School, there's a, a benefit to them as well. Currently, if a student is a junior or a senior at Duncanville High School and they have need for night school, they are able to register and attend night school at Dallas ISD's Evening Academy. With us opening up Pace High School two nights a week, we are able to keep our students in our district and allow us to meet the needs of our students without shipping them off to another school district. Um, and so there are some benefits to having night school run two nights a week at Pace High School. There's some costs of course, that would be associated with opening up the school for two nights a week. Um, I've run some, just some general numbers. If we were to do this for the duration of the school year, depending on the number of teachers that we would need to facilitate these labs, we're looking at approximately a $20,000 cost in extra duty pay. Um, there might be a small cost associated with having a security officer on campus because we'd be opening the campus up in the evening. Um, and I've even thought of the possibility if we're having kids come in for this additional assistance through their coursework, if we wanted to work with nutrition services to provide some sort of afternoon snack or something, there may be a cost associated with that as well. But I truly believe that making the building accessible to our students who we already know have a need, this is our second chance high school and we want to provide them with as much intervention as we possibly can to complete high school in a timely manner. Um, the other option that I, I want to propose is extending the school day at PACE for one hour. So essentially I want the school to run from 7.30 a.m. to 4 o'clock p.m. And in doing so, we would allow the school to have two distinct sessions, an a.m. session that runs from 7.30 to 11.30, and then a p.m. session that runs from 12 to 4 for those students who do have work obligations or do have children to take care of. They would be able to attend a full day, the four hours, and get a full day's attendance in a morning session or a full day's attendance in an afternoon session. Um, and these are students who, for whatever reason right now, because of this 77 
percent attendance rate, they're doing this anyway, and we're taking a hit because they're not attending school. So I want to be able to provide some flexible options for them. If we were to run the school building from 7.30 to 4, we'd have those the a.m. session and the p.m. session, but we would also still, for those students who are severely deficient in credits, they would still be able to come to school from 7.30 to 3, like the school normally runs at this time. And then we'd be able to provide a late arrival option for those students who might qualify or need that from 8.30 to 4. So essentially, the students would have four flexible options depending on the criteria that would be required for them to meet to, to use either one of these options so that they have a more flexible learning environment, a more flexible schedule. Um, with extending the school day for one hour, um, we do have to think about teachers and extending the school day for teachers. And so if we were to do this, um, what I'm proposing is that we run the 7.30 to 4 o'clock school day Monday through Thursday or four days out of the week and then offer one day of the week as a flex day. And on that day, the, the school would be open for half a day. And during that flex day, we would run an alternate schedule so that the students are able to get some extra interventions. I want to build in some time during the school day for mentorship build in some time for counseling relationships so that the students who do need those extra interventions, there is a set time during the school day that they are being provided with that. Um, we currently have students who are paired with the mentor at PACE right now, but there is not an authentic mentor relationship that is happening in that building. And I want to be able to create time within the school day so that they are able to get those uh, goal setting um, pieces in, get those soft skills that they need so that they can go out after graduation and be productive members of society. Um, the only cost that I can see that would be uh, incurred in looking at this is possibly having a different bus schedule because there might be some students who if they are attending school for the morning session or the afternoon session, there may be some transportation needs. And so we would have to take a look at um, working with the transportation department to see what that might look like and, and foresee some costs that may be um, associated with that. Um, but I really just wanted to have an opportunity to stand before you and share with you my thoughts. Um, like I said, I was able to meet with those teachers and they, um, they truly care about their kids and they care about the needs that their kids have. And one of the things that was very clear to me when I had a sit down meeting with each individual teacher was, we want to be able to do the best we can to make sure that these kids are graduating on time. And so I'm hoping that being able to do this will help us to stay true to the mission of PACE. Thank you and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have for me. Very good report. Thank you. Yes. I just want to thank um, Dr. Gowdy and Mr. Clark for the mention of the vision for the school and definitely PACE and Choice and a long time ago saying it's important for us to try to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sheila. The next item is a spring 2018 star update presented by Stephanie Bono. Is that correct? Good evening, Madam President, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Smith. Um, it's that time of year that gives us one of our many measures of student learning that we have as a district, and that's our STAR and EOC results. They came in on Wednesday. So I'm going to run through some of the, uh, some of the data with you. Uh, before I start, I kind of want to tell you how the presentation laid out. Um, we'll start off with our um, praises and polishes overall. And then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the ETS online testing glitch. It's been in the news, so you may have questions concerning that and how it affects Duncanville. Then we'll look at each of the tests by subject, and then we'll talk about things we're already putting in place for next year to address our polishes, our areas of growth. All right, so for as an overview, uh, some of our praises, there were actually uh, a lot, and so I, I picked some of our big rocks. Uh, the district experienced growth in most grades in math and science. Several of our campuses had significant growth in reading with gains of over 10% over last year's scores. 
most of our gains and losses align with the state's gains and losses. So in some of the areas that we lost a little bit of ground, the state lost ground as well. So it, um, we moved in the same direction. Our special education scores increased overall in reading and math at the secondary level. So it shows that we're having some systems put in place that are very effective. That was also the case with our LEP scores. Some polishes. So we had some inconsistent gains and losses in reading and math from campus to campus. Um, while we did have growth at approaches, we need to focus more on growing the meets and masters levels. So I'm gonna park there for just a second because that's a new terminology, it's only the second year that the state has used it. So approaches means that the student passed the test, so we get credit for them as a pass. Um, meets is a higher standard and is um, aligned with grade level and masters is from tax days, kind of the same as commended, but it, it shows that the student is above grade level at testing. Um, those, those markers will be very significant as we move into the new accountability system. So you'll hear a lot more um, as we present this information to you where we really look at those all three markers, not just approaches. But approaches is where we mark for our passing students. Um, while our fifth and eighth grade reading and math are in line with the state averages, our other grades are still catching up to the state average, but we are getting closer. Uh, and some of the campuses experienced significant losses in the percent of students that reached approaches and did not necessarily align with the district average. So those will be areas of concern that we, uh, we look into. All right, ETS, if you've watched the news, had an online testing glitch that kicked some students off while they were testing. So it caused one of two problems. Either the student had to log, log, continuously log back in or they were kicked out and they would try to log back in and they couldn't, but it was in the middle of their test. So you can think, you know, that disrupts the thinking and the thought process and it causes problems. Um, and after they ran their numbers and researched their data, they decided that that was true. It could cause problems. So for us in Duncanville, we don't test very many students online. Um, most of our students who test online are special education, 504 are English language learners. Because there are um, features online for those testers that we cannot give them in person, it has to be done through the computer. Um, the only other group that tests that's not, doesn't fall into one of those categories in Duncanville are our kiddos that test at Summit. Um, the online testing problem was statewide. It was definitely an ETS connectivity issue. It was not a Duncanville technology issue. Um, and as I said, it locked students out of their test intermittently. It required them to stop and log back in. So TEA set some guidelines. If a student had to log back in so many times within the, the length of their test, or if they were logged out over a certain amount of time during the length of their test, then they're basically not counting their, their scores. It doesn't count against the school, it doesn't count against the student, doesn't count against the, the teacher or the district. We had 195 tests affected by this problem. So those students and their parents have been notified by the, by the campus administration that their student was part of this, uh, this online testing problem and their tests will not count against them this year. So for our students, the significant grades uh, for students are fifth and eighth because those are the tests that they have to pass to promote. So if they didn't pass on the first round because of one of these issues, then they didn't have to retest and they didn't have to attend summer school. So that's, a, that's where we are with the, the online ETS testing problem. All right, so we're gonna look at the tests by subject. Um, what, what you'll see on each slide is the same pattern. So the whole bar represents the percentage of students we had that reached, that got to approaches. And then the arrow that you see that's on top of the board tells you what direction that is and what percentage we moved from last year. So when you look at fourth grade math, which is on this chart, we had 71% of our students reach approaches and that was an increase over to, of 2% over last year's numbers. So that's how you read each of these as we go through. Um, when, we go look. when we look at the elementary uh, grades, so grades three and four, 
we're gaining on the state average in both grades. Uh, we trended the same direction in fourth grade as the state, and we're in line with the amount of growth that the state had, so that was a, we are, are moving in the same direction as they are. When we look at our intermediate campuses, uh, we're again, we're gaining on the state. Uh, we're in line with 5%, uh, with the 5% growth that the state had at fifth grade, um, and we're trending in the right direction. We're closing the gap. At the middle school level, the seventh grade growth rate was higher than the state, and eighth grade is actually equal to the state average. Um, so we're, we're moving, like I said, we're closing that gap with, with the state, which is our, our, the marker we have right now. And then for algebra, uh, we outgrew the state uh, by 2%. And we also uh, grew our students overall. Really, uh, a very strong part of our Algebra One is our eighth graders that test Algebra One. So to give you some perspective about the impact of a, of a strong pre-AP math program, because it's the only place it's easy to disaggregate it, um, we had 100% of our Algebra One testers at Bird hit approaches, so they all passed. We had 96% at Reed and 94% at Kinemar. So um, we're, we have amazing middle school math teachers anyway, but they're really having an impact on their advanced students. Then we look at reading um, in grades three through 10. Uh, it, as I said, it follows the same pattern. Uh, you can see, and we've got some things in place to address this, the arrows kind of go all different directions. Um, so this is one of the areas that I talked about at the beginning that we don't see the consistency we would like to see. Uh, when we look at elementary, uh, fourth grade trended with the state. The state increased uh, by 2%. We increased by 1%. And intermediate campuses, fifth is close to the state average. We're only off by 4%. We're closing that gap as well. And then the middle school campuses, the seventh grade uh, was equal with the state. It was flat. The state didn't grow or lose. And then eighth grade met the state average. So we were in line with where the rest of the state is. And then in high school, actually in high school, um, although it looks like the bars are the lowest, we had the greatest gains there. And we outgrew the state by 8% in English 1. So the state was flat. It was 0% growth. We grew by 8%. And in English 2, we grew by 8%, and the state only grew by 4 So we're, we're not to the state average yet, but the margin is closing. All right, science, we only test at 5, 8, and then we have biology that is an EOC high school course. Um, again, we're trending, we're moving in the right direction. Fifth grade grew 6% more than the state average, so this, the growth for the state was 2% and we're at 8. Um, and then biology grew 2% more than the state, uh, and we're equal with 8th uh, grade. We also, in biology, I'm sorry, in the, our science classes, had the most consistency in our scores from campus to campus which is uh, an indicator of a strong science curriculum and program. And then we look at writing, grades four and seven. We have um, a bit of a loss in each category. The state went down in, each, in both of those tests as well, the same percentage that we did. So we're in alignment with where the state is. We never want to see losses, but sometimes it, it gives you some perspective to know that Statewide, there may have been a, an issue that we shared. Um, let's see. The, the social studies is only tested at eight and U.S. history, which is exit. U.S. history traditionally has um, much higher scores than when you look at our pass rate than the other tests do, and that has held true this year. So we had 0% growth, but we still had a 90% of our students at approaches. Um, and that's in alignment with the state. The state's at 92%. All right, so what's next? So some of the things that we, are, we have already started to put in place, the, the numbers were not a huge, uh, a huge surprise. 
So we've already been working on a lot of things behind the scenes in the curriculum department to ensure that we're, in a, we're ready to roll for the beginning of next year. Um, ba our balanced literacy plan will help turn all the arrows the right direction in the reading, um, which should spill over into the social studies and science and math because the strong reading skills bleed into every subject. So this year we have a comprehensive literacy plan that will provide every campus clear, effective lessons for literacy, which align with instruction, our instruction from pre-K all the way through high school. So they're the same strategies the students would see the same, hear the same terminology, and uh, it will be consistent all the way through our system. We've already started the training for that to ensure all teachers, administrators, and the supporting faculty are trained before the first day of school. Uh, this will provide consistency from grade to grade and campus to campus, which will bring the scores up and closer together. And then the other piece uh, that will offer significant impact is we're, um, we're be in our second year of implementing professional learning communities or PLCs. The administrators and teacher leaders spent a week in PLC training last week actually this summer to prepare for next year. The PLC meetings will allow for sharing best practices on campuses and across the district to help turn our pockets of greatness into widespread success. So not only will the teachers have time to meet on their campuses in their departments or at their grade levels to plan, um, to plan effective lessons, but there'll be time for them to meet across the district. So all the seventh grade math teachers together, all the eighth grade math teachers together to be able to plan so that when you see things where the numbers look very high in one area in one campus and lower in another, they can share those teaching strategies and lessons that are very effective. And then the last piece to it is we use a, a lot of the data that we get from this, we use from, excuse me, <coughs> for focus training for our teachers. So it's how we develop our curriculum professional development. The curriculum coordinators work through all of the data that we get back and build the professional development based on the high frequency TEKS from the STAR assessment and the most frequently missed um, TEKS from the STAR assessment. Okay, do you have any questions? No, thank you for your right. report. Thank you. citizens and we have none we do not have any communications being that there are no further items to discuss this meeting is adjourned thank you for coming